In the last section, you learned the key parts that made up a neuron. In this section, you'll see how they learn to represent the training data that's passed to them. First, let's revisit linear regression that you learned about in chapter two. If you remember, linear regression allows you to predict some numerical value from some numerical input values, like the price of a house given its size in square feet. If you can calculate the equation of this line, you then have a system to predict any future value that you might pass to it. Now, in the prior section, you saw that a neuron can take multiple inputs, do some mathematics, and then produce an output. Okay, so let's change the number of inputs to the neuron to be a single input, as shown here, to simplify matters, as it will make it easier to understand what's going on. Let's also make this the only neuron in the network, so its output is simply the predicted value. Now, linear regression, which is essentially the act of finding an equation of some straight line, as shown on the right, can actually be solved by a single neuron like this. Note, in this neuron, there is now a single input value, let's call it i for short. It then has a single weight that you can call w, and a single bias, let's call it b, and then an activation function, just like before. Now, in this case, Let's make the activation function effectively useless by setting it to simply pass through the input value, whatever value it might be. You can do this by setting the activation function to be the identity function, which is defined as y equals x. That means if x is 2, y will be 2. If x is 100, y would be 100. It just passes through the value. Now, looking at this new simplified neuron, you can see that the output prediction, let's call it y, is simply the weight multiplied by the input with a bias added to that. This can be expressed as y equals w times i plus b, which is mathematically the same as the equation of a straight line. All you need to do now is to find the values for the weight and the bias respectively that fits the training data best in order to predict values. Now, in order to do that, you will need some example training data. On the right, you can see I have some input values ranging from one to five, and the y values are simply double the input value. Remember, these inputs and outputs could represent something more meaningful, like house size and house price, but to keep things simple to follow along with, we'll use this simple data for now. Okay, so if you take the first input value one and feed it into this neuron, you can calculate what the output number would be. Here, you multiply by its randomly initialized weight of four, to produce a value of four, and then add the bias of three, the total would be seven. And as this activation function just passes through the number, seven would also be its prediction for the answer. Repeating this for all the other numbers in the table, you can see how far off it was in each case, known as the error. Now clearly, the current predictions are not multiplying the input by two, so all of these are wrong, which makes sense because the initial weight and bias were just random values the neuron will need to adjust its weights and bias slightly over time to get it closer to the target value. This is known as training. And in order to train a system, it needs to know how wrong it was for its current batch of predictions. For this, you can define something called a loss function. One common loss function is the mean squared error, which as you may have guessed, takes all the error values, squares them, meaning it multiplies the number by itself once, and then takes the mean of all of those by adding those results together and dividing by how many there are. For the example data you just saw, the MSE is 89. The next concept to introduce at this point is something known as the learning rate. Essentially, this describes by how much to change the weights and bias in the model to try some new values. Setting a learning rate that is very large could lead to the neuron never finding a solution, and setting it too small could mean it might take a really long time to find the solution. Often, you'll need to experiment with this value to see what works well with your data, and it will change depending on the data that you're using. Now, back to the example, you just saw that your MSE loss was 89. As this is positive, it indicates that you need to adjust the weights by making them slightly smaller as you know you want to reduce the predicted output number overall, in order to get closer to the real target output values. Now, the exact way this is calculated is done using a method called backpropagation that takes into account the loss and the learning rate to figure out by how much to change the values of each of the bias and weights. Now, the inner workings of backpropagation are highly mathematical in nature, involving something called gradient descent. 
that uses partial differentials and other things I promised you would not need for this introductory course in order to calculate the new values. In the real world, it's unlikely that you'll need to code at this level yourself, as popular machine learning libraries like TensorFlow.js will have efficient implementations that you can use out of the box to do all of this backpropagation for you, allowing you to treat these low-level building blocks as black boxes that you can just use. So the key takeaway to understand is that backpropagation will figure out how much to change the weights and biases by in each step through the data based on the current loss and the learning rate. In this case, it would reduce them by a certain amount due to the positive loss that was calculated. If it had been a negative loss, it would try and increase them instead. So in the name of simplicity here, let's pretend the backpropagation calculated that it wants to subtract 1 from the weight and 1.5 from the bias, giving you a weight of 3 and a bias of 1.5. You can now run through the training data again and calculate the new loss, which comes out to be 22.25. Getting better, but still a positive loss, so let's do it all again. Again, the backpropagation algorithm would calculate exactly how much you want to reduce the weights and bias by, but again, in the name of time, let's just repeat what we did before by subtracting 1 from the weight and 1.5 from the bias. Now, the weight would be 2 and the bias would be 0. Recalculating the predictions and calculating the MSE error gives us a value of 0. The neuron has now perfectly learned to represent the input data by adjusting its weights and biases, essentially learning the equation of the line represented by the example data. Now, one thing to note here is that in the real world, a loss of zero is pretty much impossible. And if you do somehow achieve it, it would probably mean that you've overfitted to the training data, meaning it won't generalize very well to new inputs it's not seen before. Also, Real-world input data is often noisy and not perfect multiples of two like you had here. So a single line typically would not be able to go through all the points perfectly. Instead, the line of best fit would be the solution, which is close enough for your needs. And after some number of iterations, you could simply stop according to some rules you define, such as the change in loss is under a certain threshold. Here you can see how a neuron may change its weights and biases over four steps, changing the prediction line it represents until it approximates all the points the best it can with minimal loss. Do note that in real examples, you may need more steps to get these results, but I've reduced them here to fit on a single slide for easier understanding. Also, one neat trick shown here is that as the loss gets smaller, you can also reduce the learning rate to take smaller steps to find slightly better solutions without overshooting the optimal values for the weights and bias. You can see this visually by the smaller variations in the movement for the later steps shown on the slide. And here you can see the learning rate is too large for your data. It might end up never finding a solution as it will just keep jumping around the optimal solution instead of moving closer towards the best values for the weights and bias. Remember, you'll need to experiment with these values to see what works well for your data. That's a good trade-off between time taken to find a solution and accuracy of the final solution. So bringing it all together, you just walk through an example for a single input as it's easier to follow. Remember, however, a neuron can have multiple inputs and the essence of what it's doing is exactly the same, just with more input dimensions. So if you had input data like the size of house and number of bedrooms, those would be two inputs you could then use to predict output values for, say, the house price as shown. In this fictitious example, you can see that the numbers get pretty large pretty fast due to the type of data that you're working with, which is why it's preferred to normalize data between smaller ranges. So finally, once trained and you try to use the model, no matter what input value you provide, it will always provide an output. I could provide an input value of 1 million and it will give me a prediction. But as that's outside the sampled training data range, it's simply making an educated guess of what that would be based on the data it learned from. Upon gathering more example data shown here by the blue dots, you can see that the line of best fit with this new data included is actually different. As such, you should be very cautious of using a model to predict values outside of a typical range of the training data that it was used to train on. So with that, it's time to get your hands on some live coding with TensorFlow.js once again and actually implement what you've just learned to do something useful. <laughs>